So here you, you see it's a, it's a really a huge topic, consciousness and well-being, but I couldn't help it because this is really what drives me. And um, I think when you're attracted to light, um, it changes you. I mean, the, the more you, in, you, you have experiences with light, the, the, the more you change. And then your consciousness is changing constantly. So for me, this became really something very, very important. And um, uh, Pascal mentioned, so I worked for 17 years as a lighting designer, giving um, many lectures, uh, seminars about light and the technical aspects of it. But whenever we speak about light, we have to um, mention the quantum part, because we start with photons and then we, we have to go into another um, physics and not just optics, which, which is, you can say, the simple one and the more predictable one. So here I will give some, a bit of background through quantum physics. And I have chosen to speak about um, a therapy that I'm training for since some years and that I've, experienced, I'm, I've been experiencing as a patient, you can say, um, for about 20 years. And for me, it's something really interesting that I haven't uh, had the opportunity to hear about, uh, you know, outside of uh, French-speaking countries and mainly France and Belgium. So it's just a little bit developed in, in Canada. Um, and it's really very particular. So you will hear some words about it. What a question. <laughs> yeah. And this one as well. So I said I, I worked as a lighting designer and in one uh, period of my life, I, you know, I was really a workaholic. I cannot say that I'm dealing with this part well, so I'm, I still am a workaholic, but I uh, learned to recognize the signs of, uh, you know, fatigue and stress, and then I, I start reacting in, in advance to, to not to go too far. But going uh, through a few burnouts, I started having a, a strange experiences, and that's where this first question came in. Who am I? I had an experience in which I was um, seeing, uh, you know, I was out of body and seeing a ball of light somewhere and asking myself, am I this ball of light? But the real breakthrough in this experience was the fact that I realized that it was not my brain that was thinking. So I was aware of things, but it was not in that brain lying down in the bed. It was something else. So from, I can tell you that from that moment, um, my life totally changed because it was a really different experience. So I will not go into esoteric uh, things here, but just to explain you, you know, what was the, really the, you can say, the breakthrough for, for the rest. And what do we know about the world that surrounds us? You know, you, you will hear a few words here. Just to, to um, come back to the photons, because we are uh, focused here on light. But I would say we are focused on, uh, on energy in general. And I repeated this, this information, uh, I could say, hundreds of times. And I will, I will do it one more time, because I heard Raquel Salve speaking in miles, so you just see that we speak about the candle uh, the light of a candle at a distance of 20 kilometers. But the only thing that is interesting for me is this part. Oops, sorry. Oh, I went too far, too, f too fast. Is that, you know, we can see it as a way, as a, part a particle. And what is interesting is this one. Is that the intention influences the energy and that the presence of an observer is important. So this is what I lived in my night experience, that I was suddenly an observer on something, and that started, you know, a lot of questions about myself, about life, about this experience, what am I doing here, what, what, what is all this about? So this was the main thing, the observer. 
So the spectrum, you all know it. Here in this group, I don't think that there is a single person that doesn't know this image. But what about all the other parts that we don't see? And it's all information. Now we know that this is, uh, space around it is not empty. So what, what do we know about the world that surrounds us? It's not empty. And it took about 100 years to, to prove it, from the first ideas in uh, 1887, where the people didn't have the equipment to, to prove the idea that was there. So the information was there, but they couldn't prove it. And Max Planck was repeating it in uh, 44, 1944. And after that, he spoke about um, the matrix that we today call the field. And you know that there are so many books written about this today. You have the one of Lynn McTaggart, you have many others speaking about it. So what is this field uh, all about? For me, we cannot explain any of it without quantum physics. And um, what is keeping our physical reality together? Because you can, you can, if we speak about the field, so all of us, we are not in the field, we are part of the field. We belong, we are parts of it, in a way. It's like you have uh, atoms in an organ or in a body, an, um, yeah, the cells in a body, so we make part of this field. And what keeps the whole field together is consciousness. So it's all about energy information, and the basis are photons somewhere, and if we want to find smaller particles, they will always find smaller, as long as they expect to find smaller, because it's about our intention and about consciousness. So what I hope to hear today is that, I know that each one of us is always living in a certain kind of a box, you can say, with our own beliefs, ideas, all colored uh, by our experiences, so I hope just that they're, they're, the walls are not, you know, very thick of these boxes and that we can connect with the ideas. And so what, what, am I, what am I doing here is just planting seeds and whatever resonates with you, you, you take. I find this really amazing. So nowadays everyone knows about I'm sure you all know about entanglement. But when you think about it, it means what? It means that we are all connected. We go running around uh, our daily life, you know, doing our things, being stressed with our jobs, with our families, with whatever, trying to heal patients. But it's, it's all about growing, um, in consciousness. The experience itself, I, I am sure you know it, that the, um, once two particles were together to simplify it, they stay, to, they stay connected forever. So there is no space or time separation. There is no need for, them, uh, for the information to travel at the speed of light. The information is, is instantly everywhere in every part of the universe. This thing, for me, is so, so, so amazing. And um, it's something I try to keep in always present in me, this information, that, that I'm connected to everything. There is no separation at all. Holographic universe, so... Um, I, I remember when I've heard about the book uh, published by Michael Talbot, I think, many years ago, I don't even remember when, about this holographic uni universe. And for me, this information was in a way new, but at the same time, it was so logical that everything, um, all the information you can find on the macro level, you can find it on a micro or nano level, or you know, the smaller you go, you will always have all the information in it. So each one of us has the information about the whole somewhere, as well as 
each one of our cells has a DNA in it giving the total information. Fractals. Amazing. So in, in nature, everywhere you can see this as well. You, you all know that when, you, when we start zooming, we take a leaf and we start zooming the, the borders of a leaf, we will always go to these fractal images and wonderful uh, structures. So everything around us is, is based on geometries, um, symmetries, harmony, and we are bathing in, in this soup, <laughs> in this field, and um, in a way contributing to the whole thing. And I'm not, this, I don't want to, to give any parallels between any religions. For me, there is no need to have a particular religion, but it's just the feeling that we are all, we are all one. And all expressing different facets, facets of one, of the one. This I, I wanted just to show as a small reminder, because later on I will speak about a, a therapy, a particular therapy that I, I, um, I mentioned at your medicine. Um, I find this also amazing. So the, it, it was proven that um, our DNA is reacting directly to our emotions. And the therapy I, I will explain uses the, the emotions for the, for the person, um, to, to help person go, grow, in fact, to go through the experience. So clear, this, I think this image is, is rather clear. Whenever we have, I, I, I don't think we can speak about positive and negative because I believe in this idea that there is no good or bad, there is no positive and negative. So there is something that is uh, flowing and something that is, you know, it's like blocking that doesn't flow fluently. So here we can say that, uh, we see that the strands of the DNA, they are, they can, they are reacting directly to our feelings. And um, if we stay longer in a certain state, the energetical information sticks somewhere and this, has, this can have some consequences. This is clear as well. So whatever we live as stressing, you can say less pleasant, has a totally different effect of the previous one. So this, is the, this was the main question I was asking myself when I was going through my burnouts. So wh what am I choosing? I realized that um, there was something happening in my life that the stress is really going, you know, taking over and that uh, um, it is up to me to do something about it, to understand uh, what is happening to me and to see what, what I do with it. Because the first time I went to the doctor and um, he gave me a diagnosis he, gave, he asked me so many questions that I, I understood somewhere that he doesn't know. There, is no, uh, there was no particular you know, prescription from, for my problem. And I found it finally as a blessing because it obliged me to go and look for my solution. I was not fitting in the you know, already prepared case, so he couldn't give me something to fix me. And it gave this left me uh, plenty of space to go and look around for myself. So from a lighting designer, I started looking for information. I started taking courses of Chinese medicine, um, shiatsu therapy, I learned that because I was seeing that this was helping me, so I learned that. But when I was learning that, I was always feeling that there must be something more. It's not, it's not the main goal for me, there must be something more. And then one day, thanks to the creation television, there is a show 
uh, here in Croatia called the Beyond, uh, On the Limits of Science. And there was Jacob Lieberman speaking. He was being interviewed. And that interview, you can say, changed my life. It's like you, you are going a certain path, and then suddenly there is something happening, a synchronicity, and then you just you know you just feel that it's the right way, the right thing for you to take another path, just to just leave the things and just go the other way. And so I, I discovered his book, Light Medicine of the Future, and that was it. My lighting design life was ruined, you can say, because I couldn't go back to it just simply and continue doing my lighting design, uh, functional lighting, and give lectures I was giving before, that, that was finished. Coming back to my uh, survival mode and or creation mode, this you, you all know, fight or flight and uh, um, a mechanism and um, the situation where under a, a stress that is not, not processed, we, st we can start developing uh, a certain problems, problems, physical problems. And I just, when I, the image, I just put it as a pleasure, you know, because I have so many wonderful experiences during the night. <laughs> so, so, so creative. I, I, I have to um, be, uh, how do you say, more determined to get up every time when I have the information coming during the night and start writing it down, because I'm sure that I could have a book with the things coming in. So, etiotherapy. I discovered this therapy in uh, 2000, and I found it interesting um, to, present it, it, uh, to present it here uh, at the ILA, because there are already two other therapies that come out of the same source, and the source is the work of Dr. Paul Nogier. So here, I think you, you have had one of the talks, and you will have another talk. Also, uh, speaking about auricular therapy, Daniel Assis and uh, my colleague Anne from, uh, from Norway will uh, give some more information about it. Uh, we have also Mr. Pascal Vidal that just presented me um, that is working on another therapy called photonomedicine, so that uses the, basis, the basic work of Dr. Nogier. And this would be the third one. And this one, for me, uh, its, it's particularity it's, is that it is really quantum in a way that it works with the information. It doesn't have to use light source, um, even though it uses some color filters. You will see, I will, I will show it later. But um, it's really the, the method focusing on, on the information. Dr. Jean-Louis Brinet is the the one that developed the whole method. And he has finished his uh, medical studies somewhere in 1976 and started working as a medical doctor. And very soon, uh, he was really disappointed with, with the results he was getting, thinking, I'm just writing prescriptions and I don't see any real you know, uh, improvement with my patients. Yes, they, they sometimes have some symptoms disappearing and um, um, you know, they are getting better for a time, but they come back with other problems and there is nothing, you know, deep enough, enough happening here. So he started looking for other possibilities, other ways to, to help patients, and he started following courses with Dr. Nogier. Uh, he follow, followed neural therapy uh, course. He has followed many, many different courses, osteopathy courses, I think he... he uh, he was trained in at least five different therapies. He started combining, so he was not sticking to one thing. He was going, you know, crossing from one to the other, first realizing that there is no unique solution for each person he was having in his uh, uh, practice, but also realizing that, you know, the, the depth was not always the same, so he, he, he was looking for more and more. And um, in 1988, through, uh, after, after uh, going through, uh, I don't know how many hundreds of 
situations with hundreds of patients, he came out with a method that he called etiom medicine. And the first treatment that came out was uh, the treatment of the emotional layer. Because he, he observed the body in layers. So you can say the more dense one is a physical one, of course, and then the uh, emotional one, and then mental and, and so on. So the first thing he, he came out with was the emotional. Um, I added this, this um, idea about the imbalance because that's what it's all about. Like in, in Chinese or any Eastern medicine, we don't speak about disease. We speak about an imbalance in energy and every imbalance that uh, persists in, in, in one's field after a certain number of time, uh, um, so a, certain, um, a certain time, starts condensing and manifesting in the body. So in English, it's disease, so it's something we are not at ease with, so you're all familiar with that idea. In French, it's interesting as well. In French, it's maladie, and we can make a a parallel with maladir, have a difficulty to say, to, to express. So these, you, you see two facets. So we are not at ease with something, and then we cannot express it. So we don't go through it. Very interesting. I, I'm sure you have had experiences um, of the mechanism I will describe in your lives, is that you know something in theory, and it's so easy to give an advice to another one. When it comes to your own experience, it doesn't go like that. Because then you need um, to be involved. You are involved in your own experience. And then you have feelings. And once you have feelings, you can start, you know, in a way turning around. So we know something, and then we live an experience. But the basis is already there, somewhere. It can be in the subconscious. There is an experience that triggers some feelings. We are overwhelmed. We're not capable of going through. We put it aside. That's what I was doing for many years, and then going into the burnout, huh? because there was there were so many things that uh, were put like not um, uh, how this how do you say that the priority. So you put them aside, or they are overwhelming. So you, you just put them aside, and then the, the experience comes up again, and it comes up again, and then you it's too much, and then it comes up again. And then you're just, you know, having more and more blocks in your energy field, and, but nothing comes out. And you start with a the discomfort, then some pains start popping up, and you end up with a disease. But still, it's, it's just an imbalance. When I mentioned the experience, I'm sure every one of you had somewhere in, in his life, is that you have a knowledge about something. You live the experience. There is a feeling and you, and you feel like, that's it. I, I got it. This time I got it. So I had the comprehension about this experience in my life. I become aware of it. And then from that, I can arrive to wisdom. So the knowledge is so far from this, because there, there is a road to, to go between the knowledge, pure knowledge, and the wisdom. I don't pretend to be anywhere in that, just to, to share that um, 
giving only technical lectures. I gave 4,500 hours of technical lectures with diagrams and numbers and uh, recommendations that should be done like this and like that and so on. I don't want to do it anymore. And especially in this field of consciousness and well-being. And all this allows us to evolve. And here we go again. So it's, it's, it's an infinite cycle. And we, each one of us is involved. And I don't know what I'm telling to you, it just comes through. But this I find really impressive that this gentleman, Max Planck, was such a visionary. And there are other people that said this with different words, but it's all about the same thing. Is the way, the, the moment you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. So when you were able to live an experience and you were able to understand this experience and gain some awareness, you have the wisdom and you can see it in a different way. And you cannot, you're not obliged to judge anything anymore because you went through that. So to come back to my story about etiotherapy, so the, the name of it, you will hear me see, speaking about etiotherapy, etiomedicine. The first name was etiomedicine because the, the person that was developing was a doctor. So he was a medical doctor, and that's, that's why the, the word medicine just for him was, was natural to put in. But all the people that are practicing from that time are not necessarily medical doctors, so that's why you will see as well etiotherapy. This method is looking for the cause. And um, it allows us to explore the energetics. You can see here of the, of the person, of the individual, and to work on these energetics blockages. And here you will see first the tools. Um, so like in auricular therapy, and in, in photo, uh, photonomedicine, I think as well, uh, you would use some, here we will use filters, maybe they will use some, some lamps with, with particular filters as well. Um, there are also some detectors. In this method, there is a certain number of, uh, I would say like maps, supports, um, it's, it's difficult to explain when you have not lived it at least once, you know, because it's, it's so complex that you have a sort of a guidance that will allow the, the um, practitioner to, to go through without pretending that he knows anything. So, besides that, we have to have the practitioner's effective, so his heart open, and no judgment at all. So he doesn't know what will come out. He doesn't have an idea about what is good for the patient. And the patient has to be involved in it. So he's not coming for a cure from the other one. So it, it works in a sort of a, like a triangle. So they say that the method represents 33%. Patient is there for 33% and practitioner is there for 33%. So there is an information about it. Uh, there, there is a connection between them. So there is a certain number of protocols. Um, I mentioned that Dr. Brinette came out with the um, emotional one in um, 1988 and then he discovered that when there is a lot of um, anger in, in our experience uh, accumulating, it blocks somewhere the communication between the heart and the mind. And Rasmus, in his talk, he was mentioning 
situation where our hearts are always trying to, to synchronize in a way, to come together. But it's our brains that separate us because we block to some ideas, to some thoughts, that we have some judgments that we have about another person, about the situation and so on. And that's prevents, that prevents us from going back to the heart and con just connecting to the feeling. So, in this etiotherapy, the person is, um, when, when the person comes for a treatment, the person lies down, and then the therapist takes the, the pulse of the person. So in France, uh, they call it a rack, and um, so it's V-A-S in, yes. And the, the practitioner is looking which part of the, in which part of the body, which zone, there are, there, there are some blockages. And then he uses the filters, so you can say this is an information because they are colored filters. So for some uh, protocols, lights are used as well. But the practitioner would, would uh, come closer with the filter and the patient will start reacting, which is really incredible when you, when you don't, haven't lived it at least once. Because you're there, just calm, and you know, you had an idea about what you came for, but it doesn't mean, like in any treatment with light, it doesn't mean that that's what will come out. So what comes out is what is the priority and what comes out in synchronicity without the practitioner knowing what your problem is. And then he, it, it passes through a word, through, uh, through in, in France they say it, verbe, à travers le verbe, through the verb, I don't know if you would say it like that in English. So uh, words are also information, so it sounds. And this it's like connects the information in the patient and that it feels, it opens the door. And then like in any other therapy, there is a possibility for the person to be involved in it and to go through, to accept what he, he feels about a particular situation that he's living. And it's really very intense because you, you, are, um, you, you, are, you have what, comes in the, what was in the subconscious coming to the surface but defined. So there is no, nothing random, and there is no certainty coming from the therapist. And then it's really touching, because you have like, oh, someone points the finger at something that is so deep in you, and, wow, and, and things come out. It, it's, um, um, I wouldn't say it's not a soft therapy, but it's really a, uh, eye-opening, because we, we are not aware of all the things that touch us in everyday life. There's so many things we just put aside, think, oh, you know, I will not bother with that. I know better than that. I should not be angry at him. You know, no point to react here. At least it, it was my case, you know, thinking, oh, oh, I don't have to react to all that. But not being aware of what is happening in my own mind and what is happening in me. Sometimes you react, you know, it's like there is a something coming out of you directly, but many times we, we stay polite and nice and we keep it all inside. And then I can tell you when you go to, to this type of therapy, maybe you know, it comes out, but it comes out through words as well. So you, you are aware um, of the thing itself, of what was the real problem. So here I will just go fast because I have seen that my time is out. And um, if you have any opportunity to, to, to try it somewhere, because it's, it's, a, it's a treatment that should not last for more than 20 to 30 minutes, that's maximum. On the internet you will find information that it lasts from 60 to 90 minutes. It's because the practitioner has no experience, so he is still learning. Normally, when he's an experienced one, he feels your reactions, he's not there to know. He's just there, there to stay without any judgment. And he doesn't give you any prescription, he doesn't tell you what you should do. You feel yourself what, what is to be done.
Yeah. Very interesting thing that our cells mirror also what is in the collective. So it's not just our experiences, we, we receive many other things because we are part of the field. So whatever is in the, in the field, we are getting it, each one of us, in our own way. This is very important um, that Dr. Brinette very quickly came to this you know, realization that every man has his own truth and which, is, which can only be constructed by his own experience and his awareness. So each one of us is a facet of the creation and contributing uh, to it. And this for me is an important thing because I mentioned that this therapy, uh, etiotherapy, is not the one where the person has an expectation from you. You, uh, you are there to hold the, the space or, I don't know, to, to be there with your heart, to allow the person just to, to feel what is happening inside. And we have to go beyond our comfort zones to feel it. If, if we don't accept to go through the feeling, it just stays somewhere, non-processed. And this, is, um, this comes to the previous slide where I was speaking about knowledge and then going all the way to the evolution. So it's clear. If, if I haven't lived any of the experiences I, have, I, I lived, First, I would not have been motivated to, to talk to you like this at all. And then it, probably it would have been philosophy if I was learning it in books. This is clear for everyone. And coming back to Rasmus's talk, so what we, what we are supposed to do is to be in harmony, have harmony within our hearts and our thoughts. And the main problem is, is when we have you know, blockages between the two. That prevents us from connecting to the others. So I see that it's total silence. And I hope that you have been touched by some of it. Thank you.